Um, I'm Beth Benscock. I'm the Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor of Human Rights here at Stanford Law School, and it's really a great pleasure to have you all here and to organize this event. Thanks go to the Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice here on campus, and also the Stanford Law School International Human Rights Student Group, um, both of whom are co-sponsors of this event. Um, we're really thrilled to welcome Wolfgang Kalik here from the um, European Center for Constitutional and civil rights, which is one of the premier human rights law organizations working in Europe, but also operating globally. Um, he's both the founder of the center and also now the executive director. He can talk a little bit about the work. He's also got some information here which he can share about the organization, including for the students, they do take interns, not just in law, but interns who do communications work, area studies, art, etc. Um, so definitely grab one of these brochures on your way back. Um, the occasion of our talk is the publication in, in English, finally, of Wolfgang's book, which I can really commend to you. It's available for sale outside. Unfortunately, they can only take credit cards. I hope that's not a barrier to anyone. But I, I can really recommend the book. It's part a personal memoir of a life as a self-described human rights nomad. Um, it's part a travel log, in a way, of going out into the world where human rights are being violated and where justice is being sought. And it's also part, um, really, almost a tour of the horizon of some of the key developments in international human rights, of which Wolfgang has really been involved in various ways, or if not directly involved, then inspired by. And so what it's not is a dry doctrinal text, which we have plenty of those floating around, nor is it really, I think, a recitation of kind of war stories, and I did this and I did that. It's, it's really a lovely blend of the life of someone who has devoted himself to justice for virtually his entire career. Um, and you've had a really interesting career. You've worked on efforts to address the entrenched impunity in Latin America following the transition from authoritarianism, armed conflict, and war into a period of, of more democratic transition. You've really worked around the animation of the principle of universal jurisdiction, which we'll hear more about. Um, you've worked on litigation around the global war on terror, which even had tentacles into Europe. And so we can talk about some of those cases. And now you're really working, your organization is working to respond to the commission of systemic crimes in Syria and using this principle of universal jurisdiction and the fact that Syria has become a destination not only of survivors of terrible abuses within the war in, in Syria, but also of evidence of witnesses and of perpetrators that are masking themselves as victims. And so Germany has really taken the lead on bringing some of these cases. So I think we're going to start with maybe reading some passages from the book, and then Wolfgang and I will be in conversation for a little bit, and then we'll open it up to some questions from the audience. So, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Beth. And uh, yeah, hello, everybody. Um, Actually, I had some problems um, when the book was translated into English and when we discussed with the uh, publisher. Uh, I felt it should be a microphone. It should work. I can do. I can speak. Like <laughs> that the publisher said, no, we're not, going to, we're not going to publish this version. And before I started into a discussion with them, another year passed, and I, I don't know, I find my way to deal with the situation. And 
Um, in order to express that a little bit to you, this situation, I'm going to read a little bit from the epilogue of the German version and then of the uh, recently written forward to the English translation. The um, title of the epilogue of the original epilogue is Justified Hope. Sometimes I feel like the wandering Chilean in Roberto Bolaño's story, Mauricio Silva. I cry, I feel powerless and infinitely angry. But then I meet one of the many people pursuing the same struggle in their countries, and I laugh. I laugh as I write the stories in this book, and I look forward to the next time I will those who feature in them. This alone makes it worthwhile. At a party at Bettina Ehrenhaus' place in Buenos Aires, I meet several of my Argentina friends. I, um, Bettina Ehrenhaus is one of the torture survivors whom I represented in, in, in several procedures in Germany. Um, and she is now no more um, appearing under her name, under her birth name, um, but under a different name because she says, I'm now a tango singer, and I don't, it's, it's like she, she, she wanted to get rid of a role of a torture victim, um, torture survivor, torture victim, and um, so we still maintain a wonderful relation, and so in her house I have a heated discussion about Peronism with uh, another client of mine, Marcelo von Schmeling, whose sister and father were disappeared. As a political functionary, Marcelo has stayed loyal to this odd collective of a movement that includes revolutionaries, like his disappeared relatives, in addition to married many right-wingers. Marcelo keeps referring to la nación, the nation, and el pueblo, the people, and with a rising anger I remind him how the nationalists on the right also use this category, now even more successful, I have to add. Then we started reminiscing about Ellen Marx. Ellen Marx is the Jewish mother of a disappeared woman who had <coughs> to flee um, Germany, Berlin, um, in the late 30s um, and uh, raised <coughs> kids in Argentina. One of the kids, Nora Marx, is also one of the disappeared. And um, Marcelo and I were asking us how she would plead with us for hours and hours to convince us that we, our generation, had to continue the fight for justice. At a corner cafe, I mean, the, that's all written while, that's all, this all our encounters while I write the book, I have to add. At a corner cafe, I meet mean, Mercedes Benz, trade unionist Hector Rato, now 65. Um, his haggard face bears the mark of a hard day at work and a long working life, during which his commitment to the cause led to his torture and imprisonment. He's pleased that his three daughters managed to climb the social ladder. He had never high hopes for the legal proceeding against Mercedes. Mercedes was involved in the disappearance of the trade unionist. I quote, the corporation is too powerful. The government always stepped in to help them. That's why we haven't won any of the legal battles up to now, he says. Yet, he's not frustrated about our, effort, about our efforts over the last 15 years. If you never try, then you never ever have even a chance. The legal action at least led to books, articles, film being produced about the repression faced by him and his colleagues, he says matter-of-factly. I'm glad to see Hector. He's, politically, he's a politically aware worker who doesn't need to have the world explained to him by someone like me. <coughs> and yet, the reunion leaves a bitter aftertaste. His pension is not enough. And he still has to work at an engineering factory in the, in the province of Buenos Aires. Meanwhile, I travel all over the world, living in a comparative comfort. The gulf between lawyers like myself and so many of those we, we represent is one of the biggest contradictions of our world. Merely being aware of this problem is that enough. Adriana Marcos left behind the human rights scene in Buenos Aires long ago and has become an even more forceful in her criticism. We're sitting in front of a wooden house in the middle of a small Patagonian forest. They talk about nothing else. It's not healthy. I'm more than an asthma torture survivor. I'm also a mother, a wife, an aunt, 
daughter, partner, <coughs> doctor, and gardener. Yet, she tr still travels to Buenos Aires a day's journey away to give testimony in the recent court proceedings against the military uh, uh, um, perpetrators in, uh, in, in, in the courts of Buenos Aires. She takes a nuanced view of the potential of criminal law. For her, it's not primarily about <coughs> seeing someone convicted and locked away for the rest of his life. She's not looking for any simple solutions. What I want is for some state authority, the judiciary, to publicly acknowledge that what I'm saying is true. She also wants not to have to meet the men from the military, her old torturers on the street. Above all, though, she says, society has to address the lasting consequences of these crimes. She's worried about the next generation because she sees children and grandchildren suffering from the effects of the torture. She tells me about young women who were born in prison after their mothers were raped and tortured with electroshocks and who are now suffering from serious health and emotional trauma. Emotional problems. I now switch to the, um, to the new forward. A quote from James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And funny enough, I found it, I, I, I like the quote, and when I read it now, it's basically the same what Hector Rato in, in Buenos Aires said. Three years on, 2015, 2018. A lot has changed since this book was first published in Germany. The Brexit vote, the election of Trump, the rise of right-wing extremism and racism. Such developments have at times made me question whether lawyers can remain optimistic about enforcing human rights by legal means. But after much consideration, I have concluded that the hope reflected in the narratives making up this book is still justified. In this forward are some of my key words, working experience over the last years. I believe they show that working as a human rights lawyer still carries considerable potential for necessary change to be discussed. Moscow, April 2018. <clears throat> the flying visits to Moscow have become a constant in my life since January 2014 when I took the mandate from, from Edward Snowden. The revelations by him, the man whom I represent and visit every couple of months in the Russian capital, were a result of an extraordinary courage. In June 2013, the then 29-year-old provided us with evidence and detailed commentary confirming that mass surveillance by intelligence intelligence agencies and their technological capacities went far beyond the dystopia depicted in George Orwell's 1984. By revealing this information, he risked his life, or at the very least, his freedom. Snowden's combination of courage and humility in his belief that the world can be changed, while <laughs>
Under the 1940 Espionage Act, a sinister masterpiece of political injustice, he could face a 30-year prison term for each file he copied and made public, an absurd total sentence of several thousand years. The spe special administrative measures, SAM, which can be applied to those who shared confidential information, mean he could spend the rest of his life totally in isolation. He appreciates that from Moscow he can, in a variety of ways, warn us about the dangers of state surveillance, <coughs> as well as the activities of big tech companies, especially after the latest revelations about Facebook. As an engineer interested in solutions <coughs> and solution-oriented actions, he is sometimes reluctant to believe that societal problems are not as easy to solve as technical challenges. Snow can more or less move freely about in Moscow. By the way, he will um, have a talk with me on um, Saturday uh, noon time um, in San Francisco via, um, via, via Skype um, with the Freedom of Press Foundation, the organization he, uh, he himself founded. Um, there are signs. I tell them, I, 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 I switch from one scene to the other um, in order to, to, to shed light on a little bit the variety of, of issues. Um, there are signs that we have indeed managed, when I say we, that's the network of um, human rights organizations all, of, all over the world, and activists also from social movements. We have indeed managed to use a kind of globalization from below to initiate and sustain human rights litigation that traverses national borders. But as Albert Camus wrote, there is no love of life without despair about life. <coughs> Our work is always characterized by dramatic up and downs. Who could, who, how could one not despair to see such an egomaniac as Donald Trump, apparently devoid of any human goodness, become the US president, or the torture apologist Mike Pompeo become Secretary of State, or Gina Haspel, someone who is heavily involved in the US torture program, be appointed as CIA director. Mm -hmm. But over the past few years, together with the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, we have managed to gather solid evidence pointing to the liability of prominent US officials and CIA agents and submitted to prosecutors and judges in Europe. Recently, the German Federal Credit Prosecutor's Office responded to a question in the Parliament after Gina Haspel was nominated and said it was carrying out preliminary inquiries into CIA torture and if Haspel were to visit Germany and was not covered by diplomatic immunity, she could face procedural measures. That should go without saying, you might think. Of course, Gina Haspel should be subjected to the law like any other citizen. But it's a clear improvement on the situation <coughs> a decade and a half ago when the likes of then Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld saw themselves as untouchable, <coughs> secure in the belief that nobody would ever challenge them or call them to be held accountable under the law for what they did in the name of national security. <coughs> there is long chapters about um, the mentioned serial work and also um, about the work we do um, in India um, where we try to hold European uh, corporations accountable for their involvement in violations of, uh, of uh, economic and social rights and um, I hope we can come back to that um, in the discussion. I just want to read the very last part of the forward. Edward Snow, CIA torture, India, Syria. In a sense, these are all continuations of the stories that follow this book. I've gained more experience since then, but these accounts of torture still deeply affect me. I still believe in something my former client, Alan Marx, a Berlin Jew I just mentioned who fled to Buenos Aires to escape the Nazis, once said to me, there are things that just have to be done, regardless of whether they are ultimately successful. While writing this forward, on the 50th anniversary of this 1968 movement, I come across something said by French philosophers Lefebvre and Tregrier. It seems opposite to the problem facing us today. I quote, it should be noted, what has died is not possibility, but the desire for possibility. What has disappeared is not change, but the striving for change. What has been extinguished is not life, but the yearning to transform it. What is dead is not history, 
but the desire to make it. This is something we work towards today through collaborative transnational efforts grounded and now as I believe it again in justified optimism, we patiently and defiantly face those things we hope to change. So, one of the things I would love for you to elaborate on, if you could, is um, your discussion that is presaged by the quote from Susan Sontag, where she writes about what should we do with the feelings that have been aroused, the knowledge that has been communicated, when we bear witness to human suffering. One of the most difficult passages in the book is the, you describing your visit to a Liberian prison, which, you know, can only be described as a sort of a hell on earth. Um, and, and so much of your book is about building solidarity, not only with your clients, but with others who are striving for justice as well. And so how do we, as sort of privileged Northern lawyers, how can we embrace that kind of solidarity and not distance ourselves from difficult situations and facts that are very difficult to, to take in? Not the easiest question. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, 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 no. I mean, uh, what, what I think, um, what can be regarded as a big improvement is that uh, it's difficult not to get a report about past or current human rights violations. Um, because everywhere in the world, and that is something new, people try to report and document these crimes. This is, as such, not bad. Um, but it can be an overkill of information and an overkill, you know, what what one person can or one group or one society um, can take. So um, I think um, we have to discuss the way how we how we face this 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 problem. And obviously, social media and, and the way you know how we can get access to all kinds of information is on one hand, of course, an advantage but we have to deal with it. And I think often we don't do it. And so from my point of view, it doesn't make sense to fill our heads and our senses and our hearts with all this information, with these drastic descriptions of torture and of crimes, and with these pictures. And the pictures, there are another problem which Susan Sontra addresses when she comes <coughs> with our great pictures. And so I think we, we should not forget, and that is also not only part of what I try to write down, but also part of our work in Berlin is um, to maintain, to, 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 to not to maintain, to develop a political position to all of this. And a political uh, position uh, uh, consists of two elements. The one element is, of course, information. We have to act um, on, fact, on the basis of facts, which is contra contradictory to other streams in, in politics right now. But we, it's necessary to have this well-developed basis. But then we have to talk about strategies. And we have, to, we, have to, we have to come to political and legal action. When I say political and legal action, I, I, I think it's necessary that we lawyers um, embed our efforts into broader political and social efforts. Because many of the problems uh, we're facing uh, won't be solved by legal actions, but only if, if, if other actors in, in, in society, in the world society, um, are willing to change it. And that goes especially for, for, for the uh, violations of economic and social rights, where uh, even uh, cases brought against corporations, as rare as they are, are only the tip of the iceberg. You know, I talk about uh, cases against uh, fabric owners and buyers of, of textiles in, in closes in, in, in South Africa, uh, in South Asia, where we are only able to address certain drastic disasters which happened in, for example, the Bangladesh fabric crash, and not to address the broader problem of exploitation um, of the workers in South Asia. At one point in the book, you talk about how you made sort of a self-conscious decision to shift from a model of individual client representation. You had done a lot of criminal defense work, and you had represented sort of pariah figures, but who were being oppressed by the state, where, where the courts were at times being used as tools of oppression rather than of liberation or of justice. And to shift from that model to more of an impact litigation or a strategic litigation, and then 
coffee today, you mentioned that you've actually made another shift. So can you talk about what it, the, the difference of being a lawyer in those different contexts and why you see yourself as having gone through this transition in terms of where your, your own focus is? Yeah, for me it's very important to say that it's, it's a personal tra transition. So I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to compare the work I'm doing right now to, to, to those, to the work of my colleagues who are still uh, working in prisons and, and trying to enforce prisoners' rights, or uh, my colleagues at my former law firm who defend uh, workers and trade unions or tenants. Um, these are all human rights lawyers. It's, you know, Workers' rights, tenants' rights, prisoners' rights are all human rights, although they are not often framed um, as human rights. What I try, what I try, and this is not really part of the book um, because that would have been too much. But I think the problem of, um, for example, the work with the prisoners is um, you don't earn much money with this work, and in order to have your living. You have to take many cases, and that is sometimes, in many regards, too much. You cannot do a good work. You cannot do. You cannot develop a strategic work. You're just struggling with the daily burden, with the weekly burden, and also that's. I mean, that damages you as a, as a person as well. Um, and so, it's. I, I mean, for me, it's important to have made this experience. And this is why the book is called Law vs. Power. Um, I want to bring another dimension to the struggle for human rights. And that is a bit contrary to what traditional human rights organizations do. I'm not appealing to governments. I want to put them on trial. And I want, them, I want to develop, of course, we need Amnesty International, the Human Rights Watch, and all the others as well. It's complementary. It's a complementary work. But I still, and I think that it's important to bring this element um, to this struggle for, for human rights. And um, what I'm trying to develop, or what we're trying to develop now at, at the European Center for Constitutional Human Rights in Berlin, is in a way a shift from what was described as human rights strategic litigation to legal intervention for a number of reasons. First of all, of course, everybody claims to be strategic. I mean, who would say I'm not strategic? That's the one thing. So it's it's an it doesn't say a lot. Um, and I mean, like corporate lawyers um, uh, 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 fighting, you know, the the, the Alien Tort Claims Act complaints, they also did quite well done strategic soft. So this is not this is not something uh, which says a lot. First, thing. Um, second thing is many of the most uh, exciting results of this kind of litigation were not outcome of strategic you know, thoughts, but rather than exhausting opportunities. For example, the Pinochet case. When the lawyers in the Pinochet case in the mid-90s started to file cases against Argentine and the Argentinian and Chilean um, military, nobody thought what could happen afterwards. It was rather, there was, there was a momentum, there was an opportunity, and some people throw themselves into that. And this is the main part of our struggle, to be flexible and creative enough to, 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 to discover these opportunities and then try to mobilize around this. And this is not particularly strategic, or you want to describe the meta method as, as strategic. And the other thing is, um, although I am excited by um, Jules Lobel, former president of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, um, Jules Lobel's book, Victor, uh, Success Without Victory, um, where he describes, and this was for the German and the European context completely new, that you can fail in a lawsuit but still bring forward the political cause. I think that's, that's a well thought and well reasoned book consisting of many different examples of movements, uh, went to court, lost, but still learned from that experience. But still, I think, um, to call it strategic litigation or litigation focuses too much on the, on the legal procedure or what happens in the court where I think the, the, the impact of our work sometimes uh, can take place in court and sometimes in society. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that in a contradiction. And this is why um, we, I think it's necessary to, 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 to broaden our, our, our view and this is why we um, use now to talk from the intervention. 
So as many people here will know, the International Criminal Court is foreclosed from considering the situation in Syria. Syria is not a member of the court. They haven't ratified the treaty. <coughs> Efforts to have the Security Council refer the situation to the court have failed due to the veto of Russia with China in tow. Um, there's maybe some narrow jurisdiction over um, foreign fighters who hail from ICC member states. But so far, the prosecutor has declined to move forward on the grounds that the, the gravity threats have not been met. So the ICC is foreclosed. Now, as someone who's just constantly on the hunt for silver linings, one of the silver linings is perhaps the animation or the reanimation of the principle of universal jurisdiction. And in this regard, Germany has been very much at the, at the vanguard vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Europe, and BCCHR has been very much at the you know, spearhead of that vanguard. Um, in trying to bring some Syrian cases. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the legal framework that you utilize and where those cases are at the moment. Um, yeah, Mel, I think you move closer to the microphone. The mic. Look, the pro yeah, the pro Why do you move? Is, yeah, just uh, move this. There is uh, there no real place to sit here. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You're great. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, it might sound contradictory that, you know, all this social change and uh, trying to revert externalization of the cost of globalization, uh, the example of the textile industry in South Asia, and then taking Syria cases, which are, let's say, in a way consistent with Western uh, government uh, interest. To go after Syrians, uh, to call Germ Syrian, uh, especially members of the Assad government, Secret services. You go after these perpetrators. It's in a way not contrary to the interest of the German and the French government, and so some are criticizing us to take those cases. Um, while, I mean, there's a very easy answer to that. No matter who tortured, I mean, torture should be prohibited, and uh, we should uh, make the anti-torture legal practices as robust as possible. That is one thing. And the other thing is um, we think that it's necessary um, to, that we have a very strong legal uh, framework against torture, the absolute prohibition of torture on the national, on the international, and in the UN convention. We have legal tools such as the universal jurisdiction statute in Germany, we have the ICC statute, and similar statutes nearly all over the world. And we have been able to establish a certain practice in, um, in several countries. But as um, um, one of your colleagues, Maxim, Maxim Wallana from, 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 uh, from UCLA in LA pointed out, there is, a, there is a much higher probability that prosecutors and judges move against those perpetrators uh, who are also their political and economic <coughs> enemies rather than to get into conflict with their own political and economic interest. That is true. Um, so we speak uh, in other contexts very much of double standards. But it, <coughs> uh, so that would rather speak to let the Syrian cases done by others, more conservative, more mainstream human rights organization. On the other hand, um, we have um, a community of more than 500,000 Syrian refugees um, in Germany, most many of them run through torture, experience of torture, torture survivors. And they are, like, say, uh, and many of them also activists from the, from the very first phases of all the Arab Spring in, in, in Syria. And so um, we think that, you know, we are faced with this, with this topic and, and we take it together with them also to show that so, to some extent, some kind of justice, I, I, I would be very cautious to talk about justice, but some kind of justice, some step forwards are possible. And um, that is then, of course, also, we want to pave the road in order that then, of course, and we, we spell it out, we, we go to the prosecutor and say, nice that you are so engaged in the Syria cases, but we want you also to continue the Hospital preliminary examination and other uh, complaints which we presented to them, not to talk of the of the, of the legal framework um, uh, to 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 uh, regarding um, economic and social rights, which is much weaker. And so we think that 
doing doing one thing does not necessarily prevent us from doing others. But we want to try to to, to bring a variety of cases and not to forget that we have a very strong anti-immigration uh, discourse all over Europe. And so it's also important to bring to, to the conscious of people in Europe that these people have their reasons why they migrate. It's not, it's not for fun, as some of the stupid uh, politicians are No, it's, really, it's, it's, it's so annoying. It's so annoying. It's like you want to, you, want to, you know, there was this moment when the when the when the U.S. troops <coughs> occupied Germany, they forced the German citizens, the bystanders, the perpetrators to watch the you know the documentaries about the concentration camps. And I would wish that we were able to force our politicians to watch to hear what happens in countries like Syria, in Iraq, or Sub-Saharan Africa. You mentioned this in your remarks, and also it plays a role in your book, but the, when the Human Rights Project was first conceptualized, it was very much a holistic whole, with civil and political rights residing at the same level as economic, social, and cultural rights. And these came together in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which really is the, the Bill of Rights for the international community. And yet, when those that instrument, which is a kind of a soft law instrument, although it has great legal force, was rendered into a binding treaty, those rights were bifurcated. And now we have two treaties. We have a covenant on civil and political rights and a covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. And the rhetoric around those two treaties is very different in terms of how enforceable those rights are, in terms of you know immediate, they must be immediately respected and ensured versus sort of this idea of progressive development. Now your organization has really tried to knit those two threads back together again and see the human rights corpus as a whole. Talk a little bit about how you've tried to promote economic rights, um, and particularly with going after economic actors like corporations that are engaged in labor exploitation, human trafficking, etc. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned in the, in the small piece I just read, I mentioned the case of Hector Rato and the other disappeared or, or tortured trained unionists in Argentina. Um, so. At a certain point, um, at the end of the 90s, um, there, was a, there was a political possibility in countries such as Blair-governed UK or Schröder-governed Germany, social democrats who had a certain history, government members who were in solidarity with the victims of the, of the other dictatorships. There was a certain uh, openness to put people like Pinochet on trial. So, and we did other, his Argentinian counterpart. So what we um, have been saying is that this is too cheap. This is too cheap to just point to those who have committed the dirty business of others. Rather, we have to look to, um, to the causes of these human rights violations. And you have to look at the political uh, vision of those who tortured. They taught it not because they are they, they are they are they are evil persons. They might be evil persons, but they did it, and for above all, to ex, to exterminate um, a, a big uh, part of the of the of the trade unions and of of, of, of the militant working class in order um, to install a neoliberal political and economical model in, in Argentina and in Chile. And we thought that it's therefore necessary not only to talk of the perpetrators. Still, they need to be they need to be addressed, and uh, we were active in the cases, but also about their accomplices in, in Western countries, and that is uh, the corporations, and that is Mercedes Benz from Germany, that is Renault from France, or uh, as recently uh, confirmed by Argentinian court, uh, Ford from from the U.S. And um, so. Um, when we founded the organization, our organization in 2008, we thought that many of our colleagues from the human rights scene would agree to that and would join us and, you know, apply their appearances against the torturers of the world, against the European-based corporations. But it was not the case. Uh, it was uh, it was tough. It was tough uh, to see that. And um, and so I partly agree, and I, I, I never forget to quote him in events like this, 
Marco Amoutois, post-colonial critique of international law and especially of the Western human rights movement, who tries to catch us that in this, in this paradigm, the Western human rights people and governments define the situation in the global south as one group is the victim group, the other group is the perpetrators group, and they are the savers. And we shouldn't allow Westerners, maybe politician, politicians or human rights activists, to describe the world situation like that. And so I think rather than to, to depoliticize human rights and legal human rights work, it's necessary to politicize it and talk about the causes of human rights violation, which makes it a little bit difficult. Um, but then we are approaching the real problem rather than addressing the surface. I've got one more question, then I'll open it to the audience. So if you want to start formulating your questions. Um, and you mentioned Edward Stuart Snowden, and of course, he's written the, the foreword to your um, book. Could you just give us a little bit of insights about sort of what his life is like now and what legal vulnerabilities he still experiences? And as his lawyer, what's the end game? What's a successful representation of him um, you know, in terms of the rest of his life, basically? What, you know, what, what, is, what is your goal, and what are you trying to achieve for him? I mean, um, I, I will be very old when, uh, when he's still young. Uh, so we, uh, the good thing about Edward, and this is why I also uh, wrote about him, um, is um, that he was very clear about the risk he took. So it was uh, an informed decision. It was not naivety or whatever. Um, and, and the way how he speaks about it, yeah, I would like to, I would like to, to, to find more. I mean, like, how many people are asking themselves about, you know, well, no, this is too risky. And, and then here we have a young man who throw away his whole life and said, I do that. And I mean, at that point, he had basically he was running the risk to be killed or to put in into prison and to the rest of his life. So um, we can be happy that so far it didn't happen to him. We can be happy, and that is also something I try to describe, because one thing is his revelations, but the other thing, and that is a question we always discuss, is that, okay, I did my part to reveal this. Um, many people only talk about mass events, about the uh, NSA and uh, other secret services, but Recently, he addresses more and more um, those companies based based around here, uh, and also being uh, being part of, of part of the problem. And then, so um, he says that he sometimes asks himself why it did not have more in this regard. Why didn't this shock or anger, surprise? Um, uh, about the, the scandal of the revelation didn't transform into political action. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something I think uh, it's also a, a very interesting question and we have to ask all of us why not. And this refers also to the, to the Susan Zonfer question you just put. I mean, we know that this is happening, why are we not able to act against it? And so that is something I, I really found, found find astonishing. Um, he is, um, what shall he say? I mean, he is stuck in a situation which um, doesn't seem to change in the near future. But on the other hand, how often have we said that? That is a situation uh, cannot change. History is, a, is an open process. I mean, like, uh, it, 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 we don't know. We don't know. But here we have someone Who's, who's, who's ready to, to, to confront this situation. And I hope that uh, he even speaks more out and trans is, 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 is able to, to, uh, to apply his experiences in, in this particular field of work to, to, to political work and, and such. Thank you.